This is an interview of Mr. Joseph McKeon, born November 29, 1919. The interview is being conducted by Robert Gardner. His daughter, Sheila Parsons, is also in attendance. Mr. McKeon, what branch of service did you serve in? Uh, the, the Army. And what was the highest rank that you attained, sir? Private. What war did you serve in, sir? World War II. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. May I make a comment on that? Yes, sir. Well, I was up for the draft and uh, I went through the physical exam and uh, when I got to the final results of the final doctor, they said I was too thin at the time and I'd be put on hold and come back when I gained some weight so I could handle the uh, training. So what happened after that was realizing that I would be called back, being in the college at the time, I joined the Army Reserve Corps. I went through exactly the same tri uh, uh, examination with the same doctors and they accepted me into the Army Reserve. Now, this meant that I could finish my college education. But when my college education was done, I graduated on June the 7th, 43, and I was called up for the service on the 21st of June that year. I was called to uh, New Cumberland, Pennsylvania, where the staging center was. So I was under uh, quarantine for two weeks. And then I thought on the weekend I could probably go home and see my parents, which was only a short distance from New Cumberland, Pennsylvania. But when the Saturday came, I was told I was to be shipped out that evening. So they put me on a train and they shipped me to Chicago. And this was at nighttime. And I remember getting woken up and told that I was on mess duty. So I had to get up and help get the food prepared, clean up the places, and clean up the dishes afterwards. So it seemed a long time for the train to get Chicago. When it got Chicago, it started going north, uh, northeast towards Rockford, Illinois, and Camp Grant is located just south of Rockford, Illinois, where the present airport in Rockford now is. And when we got up to Camp Grant, we were assigned to tents, and there was uh, five other trainees in the tent with me, plus about three or four chipmunks. And we went through the training and we weren't allowed to go any place but back and forth to these tents. And uh, the training, I forget, I took 13 or 15 weeks. And while in these tents at nighttime, uh, the cadre there would have uh, a band, a big band there, and the uh, uh, students from Beloit College, the women would go down as dancing partners for the cadre. But we weren't allowed to attend that. All we could do was hear the music. So uh, after that, uh, my training was done and we were in assembly and uh, 
names were called out. Most of my fellow trainees were being shipped to the South Pacific. But when my name came up, they told me I was eligible to be a doctor or a dentist because there was a shortage at the time of both of those professions in the, sir, in the Army. So uh, I uh, had never had any idea of becoming any of this, even though the college I graduated from was known for producing uh, students for professional schools like dentistry and medicine. So uh, uh, at the point, I could have gone to Marquette University in Milwaukee or University of Pennsylvania. Milwaukee would have been medicine, University of Pennsylvania would be dentistry. So I thought, well, I'm going to University of Pennsylvania, which is very close to my home. So I decided to go to the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, at, and um, they, they shipped me there to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, where I spent uh, about a month in the Veterans Hospital there as, as a trainee. So after that month was up, they sent me down to the University of Pennsylvania in dentistry. So I spent the first two semesters in dentistry at the University of Pennsylvania. And then they decided to come to Colusia. They had enough dentists in the Army. So they gave us a discharge. So my discharge, honorable discharge is from at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. So then I came up and decided uh, I, I better join the Merchant Marine. So I joined the Merchant Marine and was shipped out to, sent to Sheepshead Bay on Long Island. And there I went through the Merchant Marine training. And I was put into the Purser Pharmacist Mate School. So. While there, one of my fellow uh, classmates lived on Long Island, and he invited us home on the weekend for, uh, you know, just for the weekend. So when we got there, they were having a, a dance there. And uh, remember one of the persons that danced with was Judy Garland, and the other one was Sonia Haney. So, after that was over with, uh, we went back to Sheepshead Bay and went through this training. Now, in the training, I had to learn to type. I think it was 20 words a minute before graduating. So I got through that. And uh, while I was there, one of my fellow classmates lived his hometown was close to where I live. So we decided to go home over the weekend. So we got leave on Saturday afternoon, and then we took the train and went to Allentown, Pennsylvania. So while we were there, uh, we were thinking we got to Allentown about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Well, we'll go out on the town that night. So. And then when it got dark, we said, well, we'll take a nap before we go. So we didn't wake up until the next morning, had to get on the train and go back to Sheepshead Bay. So at Sheepshead Bay, I got the typing done and I was accepted or graduated as a warrant officer. So after, after that, we were given choices of where we wanted to go to get assigned a ship. So uh, I decided on Baltimore. And I was shipped down to Baltimore and I was sent to Johns Hopkins 
medical school. And there I was at an intern there for about a month. And then we went out to get on the ship. And while we were there, they were loading the ship with coal. And they would almost pick up the whole uh, car of coal and dump it right into the hold of the ship. So after the ship was loaded, we got out into uh, a convoy which going up the North Atlantic, which was at that point was a very dangerous place to be. But we, the convoy was always surrounded by Navy ships to protect the ships in the convoy. So we went across the North Seas and the weather was rough. Uh, a rough ride, but our ship being loaded with coal had a lot of ballast and uh, stayed almost even without getting too rough. So we were going over the North Sea and we got word to go to Brindisi, Italy. So we got over Europe, went down to Italy, and went up the east coast of Italy to Brindisi or Barry, Italy. When we got there, they told us we were uh, going to be go up to Trieste. And when we got up to Trieste, uh, we were uh, there. And while we were there, on, on I noticed that there were big bags that you could put over your shoulders. And they unloaded the coal into these bags, and there were women putting these bags on their shoulders and walking around in a circle, put, uh, getting them filled up and going over and dumping them. And I felt real sorry for those poor women, but that's what they had to do. And after uh, some of the ballast was out of the ship, the ship could rise a little bit. So from there, we were sent to Venice, Italy, where the ship was further unloaded. So while at Venice, I had a chance to visit St. Mark's Square and St. Mark's Cathedral. And uh, after we left Venice, we went down to Naples. And Naples unloaded most of the coal. So now we were put on assignment to go from Naples, Italy, over to Athens, Greece, and the port of Athens is Piraeus. So we went to Piraeus, and this was about the time that penicillin became discovered. So there was a poor fellow there who had a very infected hand, one of the uh, hands that helped unload ships. So I put some of the penicillin on his hand, and then we were taking surplus material back to Naples, back and forth to Greece. So I went back to uh, Naples and we unloaded this uh, load of trucks we had, excess trucks we had on the ship, and then we went back to Greece again. When I got back, I saw this fella and he showed me his hand. It was, like, it was so cured and cleaned up. It was like a miracle to see how fast the pellet cylinder really worked on this poor guy. So in appreciation of that, he gave me a big bottle of, I don't know what, Uzo or some kind of liquor, which I took back and put it in the ship in my room. So we went back and forth about five or six times to uh, Greece, and all this time I had this big bottle of whatever it was in my room. So after we got all that done, we went back to, to Naples. Then we were assigned to come back to the United States. So when we were there, there were 11 women who worked for the State Department. So. My job on the ship was is to take care of the health of the crew and to assign uh, rooms to 
as a person to whoever was on the ship. So we got this all settled and we had the word to go back to Baltimore. So on the way back, I was lucky enough that the, the ship was so slow and, uh, and the weather was so rough that these women got bored doing nothing. So they come into my office and they prepared all my work for me, which included overtime and uh, pay for uh, the crew and all, all of that kind of work. And in the meantime, I was in charge of a, uh, a, a place where they had supplies and things. And people could all, or the crew could come in and they could buy things from this. What was it? Get the name of it. Commissary? Or? No, no. Ship stores? No. Slop chest. That's what it was called. <laughs> and anyhow, uh, and we got, we got back to Norfolk, Virginia, and got off the ship, and they wanted to know whether or not we want to take another trip on the ship. So at this point, I, did, I thought, well, he, you know, I better go home, maybe go back to school or do, you know, something else. So what I did is went back and I met my wife and we got married. So I had four children and that, and that would be the end of my story. How did and you stay? All this time in the service, I never had a gun in my hand. I never fired a rifle. Uh, my job was simply to take care of those who were wounded or hurt in the field of battle. Something like the, a TV series, MASH. So, I, I believe that's all I can tell you. How did you stay in touch with your family? How did I stay in touch with my family? By mail. And I remember I was now being paid as a merchant seaman, and I would send uh, money home to my parents like every month. And when I get home, my parents handed me this check, which gave me all the money back again. That's usually what parents do for their children. Huh? That's usually what parents do for their children. Yeah. What was the food like? The food I, I thought was pretty darn good. Uh, uh, I can remember Thanksgiving being over in the Mediterranean Sea, and we had a Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, I think the cooks at, on this ship came from the Philippines, and they prepared a very good Thanksgiving dinner. And Christmas was likewise. Otherwise, we used to look forward to the food we got. And I, I you never say I, that I recall a bad meal. Did you have plenty of supplies that you needed, sir? Yeah, I had plenty of supplies. I, I didn't need for anything. Well, uh, but what about for the ship for taking? Huh? What about for the ship for taking care of the health needs of the people on the ship? Well, luckily none of them ever got sick. So I say I, I was the luck of the Irish. I was very lucky that things went as well as they did for me. Speaking of luck, was there something special that you did for good luck, sir? No, it's just the luck of the Irish. How did people entertain themselves? How did they entertain themselves? Well, I don't know. I, could. I said in Venice we went to St. Mark's Square and the cathedral and uh, I enjoyed that visit. And as I recall, I thought I'd order a spaghetti dinner. I had the worst dinner I ever had in my life. But that's, that's about it. Did you get to do any other traveling while you were in the service, sir? Other traveling? No, because I was on a ship. I, 
There's plenty of travel there. Do you have any photographs? Yes, we have one here. Okay. You want to hold that here, Dad? This way? Yeah. Will that work? Mm hmm. That'll work too. That's fine. Get this little one right here. Just tilt it just a bit, the light's reflecting. We just, the light's reflecting in it, Dad. We just want to tilt it a little bit more, more straight up and down, maybe a little. Oh, that's great. That's great. There you go. Who are the people that are in this photograph, sir? The people in this photograph are all cousins of mine except one. Uh, these cousins at this time were all in different services. There was, I think there was the Marines, the Navy, the Army, and uh, there were a couple of them in the Army, and those two in the Army did serve in the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, luckily, got, one was wounded, but he survived and it's okay. We had a, another friend who was born in Germany. His name was Guido Gassi, and he was in the service also in, for the United States. And he received a Purple Heart, and we all thought the world of this fellow. And uh, he became a, a school superintendent and later on passed away from cancer. Oh, that's a wonderful picture. Thank you. Did you keep a personal diary while you were in the service, sir? No. Do you recall the day that your service ended? The day that my service ended. I don't really recall the 1944. This was after being in the Merchant Marine and having been in the Army. Do you remember what it was like? Did your parents come and greet you or, or um, did you celebrate in any way or anything? Or? Well, I know they were happy to see me home again. But other than that, I don't remember any special excitement or anything. What did you do in the days and the weeks after your discharge from the, the Merchant Marine, sir? After my discharge from the Merchant Marine. I said that's, that's when I, I met my wife and uh, uh, decided to get married because I felt I had been dependent on my parents too long and I didn't want to uh, cause them any more expense at this time. At that time. Did you go to work or go back to school? I went to work. Didn't you kind of have a job of hanging out at a friend's business or something to make it look like? Oh, yeah. They had a lot of well, see, at that time they had what was called the 5220 Club. And what this was was like uh, unemployment payments. Every week we'd go up and they would give us a check for $20. So now we were free to do anything we want. So what we used to do is go up to a friend, a cousin of mine's, who was a podiatrist. And we used to sit in his office and you know, just enjoy each other. So when a real patient would come in, the podiatrist would say to one of us, you're next, and take us into the uh, room where he uh, took care of his patients, and we'd go out the back door and come around and come in the front again. So it looked like he was kind of busy. So, anything else? Did you join any veterans organizations, sir? No. Do you ever attend any reunions? No. How did your, your service and experiences affect your life? Uh, I, re I really thought they were good for me. Uh, a direct effect, I, I, 
don't remember any except the, I say, being allowed to finish going to college and uh, being allowed to graduate and being in the Army Specialized Training Program, which was, like, a, like we said after the war when they had the parade, why you'd have the Marines, the Army, the Navy, the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, and it was us. <laughs> Uh, that may be one way of looking at it, but it's definitely something that, that the services that you provided are something that were, were definitely needed and, and I'm sure they were well appreciated. Is there anything else you would like to add that we haven't covered in this interview, sir? Uh, well, I say I was married to my wife for 52 years and 338 days before she passed away. and. Uh, very nice person, and everybody liked me. Thank you. Oh, I really, really appreciate you doing this interview with us, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I, 